Welcome to the Harmful Algal Bloom webinar series. My name is Amy Weckel, and I'm from the Illinois Water Resources Center at the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign. I will be the moderator for today's session. This webinar, oh, let me try to forward this slide. There we go. This webinar is hosted by the Algal Bloom Action Team, of which the Illinois Water Resources Center is a member. The Algal Bloom Action Team is a collaboration of water professionals, researchers, and educators from 12 states in the North Central region of the United States. Team members include the National Network of Water Resource Research Institutes, the North Central, water, the North Central Region Water Network, and university extension within each state in the North Central region. In addition to hosting a webinar series, our team is developing a website of resources, including fact sheets and frequently asked questions on HABs topics. I encourage you each each of you to visit our website, which I'm putting in the chat now. Oh, shoot. There we go. Um, there you can explore some of the resources we have to date, including a What You Should Know fact sheet, a HABS Frequently Asked Questions database, and recordings from our virtual HABS Research Symposium, which was held in January, as well as our first webinar in this series, which was held in March on identifying and monitoring HABs. Before we get started, a few housekeeping items. We will have a Q&A session after our speakers present today. Please list your questions for our speakers in the Q&A panel, and we will do our best to address all of them following the presentations. If there is a question already posted in the Q&A panel and you have the same question, upvote the question, and we'll be sure to get to the answers of the most popular questions during the session. Today's presentations are being recorded and will be posted to the Algo Bloom Action Team website following today's session. If you are having any technical issues or have any questions about the Algo Bloom Action Team, please list those in the chat as well, and we will be happy to assist you as best we can. Today's session is the second. Oh, okay. Uh, well, hopefully, hopefully you can all hear me okay. Um, it's I, fine on my end. You, you sound just fine. Okay. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, Holly. Um, all right. Great. Thank you. Um, today's session is the second of the Algo Bloom Action Teams HAB webinar series. These webinars are held bi-monthly with our next webinar scheduled for July 7th. Today's presentations focus on HABs and public health, and we have two great speakers lined up for you. Our first speaker does not want to advance. There we go. Our first speaker is Victoria Christensen, a research hydrologist with the USGS Upper Midwest Water Science Center. She received her BA from Hamline University and BS and MS degrees from the University of Kansas. She will receive her PhD from North Dakota State University this spring. Her PhD research focuses on cyanotoxin measures in freshwater environments. She has worked for the USGS since 1992. Victoria's presentation entitled Cyanotoxin Mixture Models, Environmental and Comprehensive Variables for Estimating Toxin Concentrations in Voyagers National Park will kick us off today. Victoria, thanks for joining us. And I will stop sharing my screen now and turn it over to you. Okay, thank you. And um, thank you as well for inviting me to speak today. I'm gonna to try to share again here. So is everybody seeing the um, title slide now? We see, but you're not in presentation mode. There you go. Now you're in presenter mode, so we can see okay. your second slide as well. Okay, it seems like maybe there's a little bit of delay, but we'll work with that. So I do wanna to talk to you today about cyanotoxin mixtures, um, but first I'd like to recognize my co-authors that are, are listed on the screen there. And these are my colleagues from the US Geological Survey and the National Park Service who helped with the sampling 
effort, and then also my advisors at North Dakota State University. So before I talk about, it's not going forward, okay. Before I talk about the actual cyanotoxin mixtures, I do wanna um, introduce you to Voyager's National Park. So Voyager's National Victoria, Park is in Northern- Victoria, sorry, sorry. to interrupt you. Um, it looks like you are in presenter mode, so you might have to go up to your display. So oh. I guess it did not remember right. that from the last time. Um, let me fix that. Okay, I don't remember how I fixed it last time. So you just go to display settings um, and then you can switch the two. It should be. Okay. I don't see where the display settings are. How come this worked a minute ago when we tested it? <laughs> um, yeah. And um, where is the where is the display setting? Should be at the top of your screen. There's show taskbar, display settings, and then end slideshow. And it's the middle one, uh, display settings. And you should click down there and be able to switch. Well, it's not doing it for me. Hmm. Uh, um. <laughs> I don't know what the problem is. What I can do maybe is um, maybe switch the, here, let me unshare for a second. Sure, unshare, then try again. Sorry about this, folks. Oh, oh that's where it is. So if I unshare, <laughs> I can swap screens. <laughs> okay, now. I'll see if I can share again. Are we seeing the right one now? We are not seeing your screen at all now. Okay. Well, let's see if we can't figure this out. We did um, practice, so this <laughs> shouldn't be happening. Anybody see it now? No. Uh, All right, so I'm actually gonna share my screen, uh, Victoria, and I have your slides. So I will um, share them and then you can just tell me when to advance. How does that sound? Okay, I did try something else just now. So I'm wondering if it works now. We do see your screen. Why don't you try presentation mode or uh, show the slide slideshow and see sure. if it works. Okay. Now, where are you seeing the right one? We're in presentation ah, mode. Can you see the display settings and switch Yeah, it? it won't let me go to display settings while I'm sharing and I have to unshare. So let's just go with you. Um, I'll, unsh I'll stop sharing again. And we'll just go with your slides because I don't want to hold things up. Okay, so you can go to the next slide. And so just to repeat myself a little bit, Voyager's National Park is on the border of um, Minnesota and Ontario, so the Canadian US border. And it's downstream from um, several areas, wild areas, wild and pristine remote areas like Quetico Provincial Park and Superior National Forest. Um, and also the Boundary Waters Canoe Area. And so the waters are, aren't subject to the traditional um, 
inputs from say uh, agriculture or urban areas because it is so remote, remote and the waters are fairly clean and pristine and clear. And in Voyageurs, they um, have about 250,000 visitors per year that enjoy the, the water of the area. Can you go to the next slide, please? And this is a close-up of, of the park. And I'll just read what the, the park was um, founded in uh, the early 1970s. And the enacting legislation states that um, the park was established to preserve the outstanding scenery and geology, biological diversity, and cultural resources within its vast interconnected waterways that shaped the historic route of the voyageurs. And voyageurs are French Canadian fur traders who um, traded European goods with the Anishinaabe and the um, Ojibwe Indians of the area. And you can see their trade routes that are highlighted in the dotted lines throughout the um, presentation there. Um, so in that historical context, you can see the importance of the water in Voyageurs National Park. Um, in a more modern context, uh, the, all the campgrounds in the park are only accessible by boat. So you can really see the importance of it. Now the park has 30 small lakes and five large lakes that are hydrologically connected. And these are natural lakes that were um, dammed in the early 1900s to provide power for the pulp and paper industry um, and the timber industry. Now flow in the area is generally to the Northwest. If you look Victoria, your audio has cut out. You may want to shut off your camera during your presentation. That may help. And can you hear me? I can hear you now. Yep. Sorry. Um, okay. Next slide. I'm getting I'm getting um, some interference here. It looks like, um, but anyway, we'll keep going. So there's been algal blooms in Cabotogama Lake since the early 1970s, since the park's inception, and these are caused by excessive nutrients in the system. The surrounding geology is really important, and if you look at the difference between these two pictures, much of the park has this granite shoreline that, as you can imagine, might, doesn't add many nutrients to the system. But on the south side of Cabotogama Lake, um, it's been affected by Glacial Lake Agassiz. Um, and the retreating glacier left behind soluble minerals that are sediments that are rich in soluble minerals. And as you can imagine, these soluble minerals are high in um, both specific conductance and total phosphorus. Um, one thing that is different about this area as well is the water levels are manipulated with rule curves. So this um, means maximum and minimum water levels that the park is, or the dam operators must maintain um, throughout different times of the year. Next slide. And so the difference as well, we know that algal blooms don't just contain algae, they contain cyanobacteria and cyanobacteria can produce toxins, which is what elevates this to a serious human health issue. Next slide. Now I'm gonna give you a little background on cyanotoxins, but um, I'll only talk about a few of them that are uh, important for this project. Now we have numerous cyanobacteria that are capable of producing toxic metabolites that we call cyanotoxins, and there are hundreds of different cyanotoxins. Um, and to complicate matters, uh, there are many cyanobacteria that can produce more than one toxin. Now, two that I'll talk about in more detail are anatoxin A and saxatoxin. Next slide. Anatoxin A was first isolated from a strain that killed cattle in Saskatchewan, Canada in the early 1960s. 
it was very it was originally called very fast death factor um and that was because of the speed with which it killed mammals in a matter of min minutes now the structure of anatoxin a is similar to cocaine and it is in fact a neurotoxic alkaloid just like cocaine it mimics acetylcholine in the body. And so that is a neurotransmitter. And what it does is it overstimulates the muscles, which leads to fatigue. And then this overstimulation also includes the muscles involved in respiration. And the result is death by respiratory failure. Next slide. Saxitoxin is the name of an individual toxin, but it's also the name of a class of toxins. And interestingly, it was used in suicide pills by CIA pilots during the Cold War. It works a little differently than anatoxin A in that it blocks sodium channels along nerve cells, um, which in turn suppresses the transmission of nerve impulses. And um, the stimulation of muscles is suppressed. And this includes the stimulation of those muscles we use in respiration. And the result is the same, respiratory paralysis. Um, there is quite a bit of research on saxitoxin, but this is mostly in marine environments where um, saxitoxin is known to bioaccumulate in um, shellfish. Next slide. So why does all this matter? Well, um, I think I already mentioned that Voyager's National Park has 250,000 visitors per year, and these visitors enjoy swimming, fishing, they possibly eat the fish, and in remote areas, people drink the water as well. So this is what elevates this um, to a potential serious issue. Next slide. So one of the problems is that there are numerous cyanotoxins in freshwater, yet most monitoring um, is focused only on microcystin. Next slide. And part of the problem with that is that microcystin is not the most toxic. So in this slide, you see the LD50, which is the lethal dose whereby 50% of the organisms would die at that dosage. And those smaller dosages for saxitoxin and guanotoxin, for example, means that's more potent. So saxitoxin and guanotoxin are more potent than microcystin LR. And homoanatoxin A and anatoxin A are mo more potent than many of the microcystin congeners. Next slide. So for this study, um, we wanted to develop a cyanotoxin mixture model. And to do this, we collected 123 environmental samples plus many more quality assurance samples over two years. We collected from the beginning of the season, so as soon as ice was out in the spring, all the way through mid-September, um, even if there were no um, blooms present. And we selected three locations. And these three locations were selected for two main reasons. First, because they're popular recreational areas. And second, um, they have recurring blooms. Uh, blooms typically occur year after year. Okay, can we go to the next slide, please? In the laboratory, uh, we did routine water chemistry. This included total nitrogen, total phosphorus, and the dissolved species of nutrients as well. Uh, we looked at phytoplankton and did phytoplankton identification and enumeration and biomass. We uh, analyzed toxins in 2016 and 2017. We did this by ELISA. And we analyzed anatoxin, saxitoxin, and microcystin, but um, cylindrospermopsin as well, although we only had a few hits of cylindrospermopsin. Then we looked at the toxin genes with molecular assays. Next slide. So molecular assays are important because that's how we determine um, the difference between toxin-producing strains and um, strains that do not produce the toxins. So the way that works is in the lab, they can differentiate the genome to tell if the MCYE gene is present. If that's present, it can produce microcystin. If it's absent, it can't. And the same is true of SXTA for the saxitoxin um, toxin and ANA-C for anatoxin. Next slide. We also, um, in addition to field variables and um, 
laboratory variables, we gathered other data as much as 60 parameters from weather stations. Um, this is just a, an example of that data we collected. And some data was averaged over some very or various antecedent time periods. Some variables were lagged between four and eight days. Next slide. So first I wanted to talk about the timing. So once the um, data started coming in, there were some interesting uh, things happening with the toxins. So a question I had was, do neurotoxin concentrations peak before microcystin? Next slide. And although this is only one site and one year of data that I'm showing you here, we can see that saxitoxin peaked a full week before microcystin. And this would be problematic if you were only looking at microcystin, if it was that type of monitoring program. Although these concentrations here happen to be fairly low. Next slide. Another question I had to do with the timing are, are cyanotoxins present before visible blooms? Next slide. And we can see here that um, the lower graph shows toxin producing strains. And these were present in June as soon as we began sampling. Visible blooms or more moderate blooms began appearing in July. And microcystin was first detected in July. Anatoxin and saxitoxin were first detected in August 1st and August 11th, respectively. Um, but what I had the field personnel do is mark on the field sheets whether or the severity of the bloom on a scale of zero to four. And um, for most of the summer, it was a one. So it wasn't a very severe uh, summer in terms of algal blooms. But there were four dates when it was a zero, and those are marked with the green stars. Um, and three of those four dates, we had microcystin concentrations that exceeded water quality guidelines. Um, so the, the answer to that question is yes, it is possible that for cyanotoxins to be present when there are no visible blooms. Next slide. This is just another example of timing. So, I'm looking at two different years here and the data um, from just Sullivan Bay, just one of the sites. And microcystin is in the yellow. And as you can see, it, it occurred all over the place in 2016. But 2017, although we had um, saxitoxin and cylindrospermopsin and um, anatoxin, we had no microcystin. And again, this would be problematic um, if we were only looking at microcystin. Next slide. So I had some questions regarding env environmental influence and what causes those different toxins um, to be present. And the way I did that is to develop models. So next slide. I used Virtual Beach software, and this is a free software that's developed by EPA and um, with USGS and, and Wisconsin DNR assistance. It was developed for determining bacteria like E. coli at swimming beaches. Um, I used multiple linear regression techniques within the virtual beach software, but there are other techniques available now, um, including gradient boosting machine. Um, it requires two years of data, and um, it's been used for microsystem before to estimate microsystem at swimming beaches, but I used it a little differently, and I used it to develop models um, for microcystin as well as a cyanotoxin mixture. Next slide. So the way I did that was to normalize the saxitoxin and microcystin concentrations to anatoxin. Now the software requires that you use uh, or in, you put in um, threshold values or like uh, criteria values. And so the state of Minnesota doesn't have all three, the US EPA doesn't have all three, but the state of Ohio does have anatoxin, saxitoxin, and microcystin concentration or criteria. And so that's what I used for the model development. Um, I multiplied microcystin by 12.5 to equal the uh, sac or anatoxin value, and then saxitoxin by 100. And I used both Akaike's information criterion, and that was to select the independent variables to include in the model, and also the press statistic um, in order to choose which was the best model. Next slide. 
So I developed four models total um, following this design. There were um, two cyanotoxin mixture models and two microcystin only models. And for each of those, I did an environmental model, which means that it was just parameters that we could potentially get in real time, some were near real time, like field values and weather value um, variables. And then also comprehensive um, variables or comprehensive models that include the laboratory variables. So the comprehensive models in included all the environmental variables as well as the laboratory variables. Next slide. So I won't talk too much about the environmental or models, except to say that they identified specific conductance and lake level as the most predictive of toxin concentration. And as you, if you can see from this picture from our earlier discussion of how lake levels are so important in Cabotogama and how changing lake levels might bring in more sediments, more vegetation, and therefore more nutrients to the system. Next slide. Now, here is the comprehensive microcystin only model. This model um, found that water temperature, total phosphorus um, were significant, as well as microcystis specific MCYE gene. So remember, that is the gene that shows that it's capable of producing the toxin. Um, the simulated value, values compared to the observed values. But the upper um, graph, and can everybody hear me okay? Because I'm getting a message that my internet is unstable. I'll keep talking until somebody says something. Okay, what's interesting about this upper graph um, is that it shows there are both false positives and false negatives. False positives are less serious in terms of human health in that um, it shows that uh, concentration was there, but the model didn't predict it. Um, oh, I'm sorry, that's the other way around. The, the, the model predicted a concentration that didn't really happen. So what this means is that a beach may be closed um, when it really didn't need to. Whereas a false negative is the opposite of that. And that is when there was a true concentration of a value that exceeded the guideline and yet the model did not predict it. Next slide. Okay, and here's the comprehensive mixture model. And this had many of the same variables, including total phosphorus, planktothrix specific MCYE gene, and also those genes that show that it's capable of producing the toxins, anatoxin and saxatoxin, wind direction and lake level. And this had a similar R squared and um, it worked similar except that you can see in the upper graph that there were no false negatives. So this was true not only of the comprehensive mixture model, but also the environmental mixture model that there were no false negatives in either of these models meaning that it is, both models are more protective of human health. Next slide. So this is the summary of how well the models did. And um, one obvious conclusion might be that the comprehensive models appear better and they are better models, but just remember we did use more variables. So an R squared will always be greater when you have more variables. We had six variables in the comprehensive models and three variables in the environmental models. Um, there were no false negatives in either um, cyanotoxin mixture model. Um, and then microcystis and planktothrix might be important uh, uh, taxa to look into further for, for future research. Next slide. So in summary, uh, neurotoxins like anatoxin A and saxatoxin are important predictors of overall risk. The neurotoxins don't peak at the same time as microcystin and um, toxin also, toxins also may be present um, without visible blooms. I've listed on the screen some of the parameters that were important for predicting toxin occurrence or estimating toxin occurrence. 
and a three toxin mixture model had no false negatives in either model. Next slide. Now, there are three reports available uh, for the data that was in this presentation. The final one is the one on the cyanotoxin mixture models. You don't have to uh, scramble to write this down. I'm going to paste them in the chat when I have a chance. Next slide. Um, if you would like to jot down my email, um, I would be glad to answer um, questions or send you copies. Um, the question and answer will happen after um, Virginia's talk. So I'll just end it there and turn it back over to Amy um, in order for Virginia to give her talk and I'll, and I'll be here for the Q&A in just a bit. Thank you, Victoria. That was great. Um, let me share my screen again. Okay, our second speaker is Victoria, or I'm sorry, Virginia Roberts, who is an epidemiologist in the National Center for Emerging and Zoonotic Infec Infectious Diseases within the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, where she has worked on waterborne disease and outbreak prevention since 2007. She currently leads programs, program activities focused on understanding and preventing illnesses associated with harmful algal blooms, such as the One Health Harmful Algal Bloom System, or OHABs. Virginia received a joint Master's of Science in Public Health from Emory University in Epidemiology and Environmental and Occupational Health. Her pre-recorded presentation entitled The One Health Harmful Algal Bloom System will be our final presentation today. Virginia is on the line, so don't forget to put your questions in the Q&A panel and we'll address them following the presentation. Let me switch out to the presentation. We'll be talking about public health efforts related to harmful algal blooms and in particular the One Health Harmful Algal Bloom System. Many of you are likely familiar with the concept of a harmful algal bloom. Oop, Amy, you muted yourself, which also meets the presentation. <laughs> economy. These harmful algal blooms. Okay, are, let's start again. Sorry about that. We'll be talking about public health efforts related to harmful algal blooms, and in particular, the One Health Harmful Algal Bloom System. Many of you are likely familiar with the concept of a harmful algal bloom, but for those who are not, I'll provide some brief background. Macroalgae and phytoplankton can grow rapidly or bloom and may cause harm to people, animals, the local ecology, or the local economy. These harmful algal blooms, or HABs, are supported by factors such as warm water and nutrients. Public health concerns primarily focus in on two types of phytoplankton and the toxins that they can produce. Cyanobacteria, sometimes called blue green algae, and microalgae, the blooms of which you might know as red tide. HABs occur throughout the United States. Cyanobacterial blooms typically occur in freshwater settings and microalgal blooms in marine or brackish water settings. People and animals are primarily exposed to HABs and their toxins through skin contact, inhalation, and ingestion. This could be from swimming or other recreational water activities, breathing in water droplets that contain toxins, or using contaminated tap water. Seafood can bioaccumulate and pass on HAB toxins when eaten. Dietary supplements or food that contain algae can become contaminated. Treatment is primarily supportive care to alleviate symptoms. Animals may be at increased risk of exposure or severe illness. Some of this might relate to physiology, but also to behavioral characteristics that differ from humans. Animal illnesses may serve as early indicators of a HAB or its severity, and also provide information about risks and health impacts of HABs. From a public health standpoint, there are still many questions about HAB exposures and the illnesses that they can cause. 
CDC works to mitigate and prevent have associated illnesses in several ways. One of these is national public health surveillance, which will be the focus of today's presentation. CDC also develops health communication tools and resources to raise awareness and increase knowledge about HABs, provide public health related technical assistance for preparedness and response during HAB events, and support state HAB program capacity building efforts. Additionally, CDC conducts health studies to understand exposures to toxins, develops diagnostic testing methods for toxins, and collaborates with state and federal partners through work groups and other activities. CDC looks at HABs through the lens of One Health, which recognizes that the health of people is closely connected to the health of animals and our shared environment. It is a collaborative approach that recognizes the benefits of many sectors and disciplines working together to achieve optimal health outcomes. So this next section will provide some background on public health surveillance through the One Health Harmful Algal Bloom System, or OHABs. OHABs is a nationally available system for state and territorial public health agencies, which can also designate user accounts to environmental and animal health partners, such as their State Department of Environmental Quality or Agriculture. It allows for systematic data collection about HAB events, human cases of illness, and animal cases of illness. Reporting is voluntary, both in general adoption of the system and for its components. For example, one state might only report HAB events, while another might also report human or animal cases of illness. OHAPS does not replace routine water monitoring, real-time investigation tools, or event response systems. So investigation and reporting may depend on a variety of factors. In the example shown here, people who become ill after a trip to the lake contact their poison control center, their health department, or a medical provider. Any cases reported directly or indirectly to the health department are interviewed, um, and the health department works with partners such as state agencies to collect and review other supporting evidence before entering data into OHABs. This screenshot from OHABs shows some examples of how environmental, human, and animal case data can be reported and grouped according to a single HAB event. On the far right, the numbers indicate how a single HAB event is linked to a human or animal case in OHABs, with the number of human cases listed below the person icon and the number of animal cases listed below the dog icon. Reporters to the system review available environmental, epidemiologic, and clinical data and use OHAB's definitions to classify HAB events and associated human and animal cases. These definitions are considered um, using current scientific understanding and will benefit from refinement over time. Challenges to investigating and classifying cases include limited access to diagnostic testing for humans and animals, and sometimes to timely and routine environmental testing for HAB events. When this information is available, a challenge can be to interpret those findings as they relate to health effects. Next, I'll share some of our initial findings from the first three years of data reported in OHAPS. There were 18 states that we refer to as the early adopters of OHAPS. These early adopters reported 421 HAB events, 389 cases of human illness, and 413 cases of animal illness that occurred from 2016 through 2018. Although no people died, 369 animal cases were, animal deaths were reported. As expected, HAB events and cases of illness occurred most frequently in warmer weather months, with HAB events and human cases peaking in July. Overall, 90% of reported HAB events were freshwater cyanobacterial blooms. A large multi-month HAB event was responsible for 51% of, to of total cases of human illness. A HAB event at a lake in May affected a flock of wild birds and accounted for 73% of animal cases. 88% of OHAB's reports included environmental testing results. The most common reason for conducting this testing was routine monitoring. Water quality monitoring programs can lead to early detection and notifications to the public. Citizen complaints in human health or animal health event response were also important contributors. Toxins were the most frequently reported result of environmental testing, indicated for 83% of the HAB events in which testing occurred. Within those results, microcystins, a set of cyanobacterial toxin, were reported for 94% of HAB events. Now, at least 39% of human cases were under the age of 
18 years, and people became ill within a minute or up to eight days. Healthcare seeking behavior was limited, except for contact with poison control centers. And this was driven heavily by a single HAB event in which people contacted the poison control center, um, which was coordinating with the state. Of all of the human cases reported, 8% had clinical testing done to identify or rule out a cause of illness. CDC confirmed exposure to foodborne toxins in four people. Within the categories of domestic pets, livestock and wildlife, the most frequently affected animals were dogs, cattle and birds. For one-time exposures when available, illness onset ranged from 15 minutes to four days. Veterinary medical care or treatment was provided to 6% or 25 animals. Gastrointestinal or generalized categories of illness um, were the most frequently reported for 380 humans and 92 animals. Generalized refers to constitutional symptoms such as headache, fever, or lethargy. These data help to illustrate that signs and symptoms for HAPS exposures may be similar to other illnesses and therefore difficult to link to a HAP exposure. Now, most HAB events were classified as confirmed, human illnesses as probable, and animal illnesses as suspected, based on the state's review of the supporting evidence upon submission to OHABs. Please note that HAB events are only classified as suspected or confirmed. For human and animal cases, it will be of interest to see how classification of future cases might shift as availability of diagnostic tests increases. Now, let's take a step back from the data and draw some general conclusions. This summary of OHAP's data from 2016 through 2018 represents the launch of national public health surveillance for HAP events and associated illnesses in the United States. It's a landmark step forward in better understanding the impacts of HABs on human and animal health. Looking ahead, we're planning to increase use and access to OHAP's data, including more routine and timely releases of annual data summaries. We're also continuously focusing on efforts that will support adoption and reduce reporting burden. We want to strengthen and expand the One Health partnerships that are so critical to all steps in surveillance, from detection through reporting and use of the data for illness prevention. A continued One Health approach to surveillance alongside developments in the field um, and, in, and increased access to specimen testing will improve the system as a whole. Now, please check out our out CDC's HAB Associated Illnesses website to learn more about HAB exposure and illness and what you can do to protect yourself and loved ones from HABs. The website also includes a section with technical information about all HABs, plus a section with health promotion resources, such as physician and veterinary and reference cards for cyanobacterial foods. Several of these resources will soon also be available for download in Spanish. And printed copies of a pet safety poster are available to order for free from CDC. I want to thank all of my colleagues on the report that we discussed. They're here on the left in italics and the many local, state, and federal partners who are too numerous to list in full, but essential to this effort. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Virginia. That was great. Uh -huh. Get back to the presentation here. Okay, thank you uh, everyone for participating in the Algal Bloom Action Team's webinar series. And as a, a special thanks to our presenters, Victoria and Virginia for sharing their research with us. As a reminder, this webinar will be held bi-monthly with the next webinar scheduled for Wednesday, July 7th at 11 a.m. Central Time. Um, our website is at the bottom of the slide again, and um, you can use that to connect with the team and subscribe to our events. Following the Q&A session, please uh, click on the survey link provided, and we appreciate any additional comments or feedback you have uh, for this series. And we will now move into the Q&A session of the webinar. We will draw initial questions and comments from those submitted in the chat box during the presentations. We will do our best to get to all of them. So. Let's go. Um, and is there a particular order I should do these in? Yeah, let's draw from the upvoted comments first. So the first question on the list in terms of open questions is the one that received one upvote. So let's go ahead and go with that one first. 
Okay, thank you. Um, so Beverly says, I had heard that if you do not see a bloom, microcystins wouldn't be present. Clear water is safe. Does your study con contradict that? I believe that's- Okay, correct. assume that question is for me. Um, yes, somewhat. Uh, it's important to remember that there were blooms at these sites, um, although they were not severe blooms, but they may have been there even the day before. Um, but they did have, there were at least three dates where the water was clear, at least in the eyes of the field technicians who were looking at the water and, and um, saying that it was clear or zero on a scale from zero to four. But yet there were three concentrations of microcystin that either um, approached or exceeded the drinking water guidelines. So there were I think there was one that was 0.92. The other ones were one point something. So it was just above the drinking water guideline. Thank you. Um, okay, and Larry would like to know, current research in Ohio indicates that nitrogen plays a key role in toxin production. Did you look at nitrogen and dissolved phosphorus concentrations in your model development? Yes. Um, we we looked at all the um, nutrients, including dissolved species. Um, they were not significant. One of the problems was there were a lot of non-detects for um, like nit nitrate and for um, orthophosphorus. So uh, it, they were not significant in the model. Okay. Rashmi would like to know, did you see MYCE gene RNA expression? If so, it is interesting to see gene expression with bloom vis visibility. Yeah, that'll be the next study. Uh, we did not analyze for RNA for this study, so um, we don't know. Okay, thank you. Uh, Megan would like to know, did you perform microscopy to determine what species of cyanos were present in producing toxins? Um, yeah, so some of these were in the chat earlier and I was answering a lot of these um, online. So this question was already here, but um, we only looked for 2016 and 2016, 2017 when we developed the model, only looked at um, the phytoplankton and cyanobacteria in at one site. So we only have that data from the Sullivan Bay site. And we know which species were there. We know Microcystis was there, Planktothrix. We know Dilithospermum was there. Um, let's see what else. There were several other microcystin producers. Um, I'm, I can't remember which one was domi dominant in 2016 and 2017, um, but even let's say, uh, Planktolingbia was there. There was there were quite a few, um, and and depending on the year that you look at the data, not just 2016 and 2017, but later data as well, different species are dominant in different years. Okay, and then we have a comment from Cindy who says that most of the toxins are released upon cell death, so the bloom may be gone, but the toxins persist. We found that cylindrospermopsin is incredibly persistent, lasting months after any sign of producers. Yep, that's true. So thank you, Cindy. Okay. Um, are all the states in the North Central Region Water Network planning to report data to OHABs in the coming years? If not, what resources are needed to make that happen? So I think that's a great question, and I really appreciate that. Um, the decision to report in OHABs, um, I'm sure, takes takes into account a number of factors within a state in terms of what they're seeing, in terms of um, HABs and the severity, the the resources they have in hand already, the networks and the the capacity. Reporting is a voluntary process. So um, while I can't say whether every single state is uh, planning to report, certainly if there are states that are interested in reporting, we can work with those states to um, kind of tell them more about what it would take um, from a kind of from an entry standpoint um, and talk and connect them with states that have had have already adopted the system, that sort of thing, to think through what resources they might need. Um, but we can certainly help them think through the process of whether they, they want to start reporting um, and um, how we can connect them with others. 
um, certainly resources, I guess, might. I, I, I will just kind of briefly pause to say, I know that some of our states that do, that do report, um, some of the things that they have mentioned have been useful, have been really having some of those partnerships and connections that support um, you know, detecting blooms and illnesses, investigating and evaluating the data, and then enabling them to report after. So, so things that really uh, support that type of work. Great, thank you. Oh, go ahead. I just wanted to just kind of add, uh, I really want to thank thank you um, and Anne for the, the flexibility. I wasn't sure I was going to really be able to make it earlier. I really appreciate the flexibility today well, with the presentation. It's great to be here. Yeah, we appreciate your participation for sure. Um, okay, Hal would like to know how many samples did you test for MYCE or Anna C to have confidence that the bloom would not produce toxins? And a follow-up question, are blooms generally homogenous or can they have variants that can create a mix of toxin producers and non-toxin producers? Okay, that's, I'll answer the second part first. Yes, there's probably a mix of toxin producers and not, and, to, and you know, cyanobacteria that don't produce the toxin. So your first question was how many samples? Um, you know, we collected about a 60 samples per year. We, you know, could have collected more, but that's not realistic. Um, I'm not sure if I know the answer to that question. How many are enough to um, be certain that there are no toxin producers there? Because really every single sample had some degree of toxin producers in it. Um, so it's, it was just a matter of the toxin gene counts more than presence absence. So I'm not sure if I really answered the question, but it kind of gives you an idea of what we were looking for when we were doing those toxin gene analyses. Hal, if that didn't answer it, go ahead and put a follow-up question in the, in the Q&A and we'll try to get to it. Um, Heather would like to know if there are field tests that can be used to quickly identify HABs and or toxins. Okay, I can answer this. Um, there are test strips. Um, we did an experiment in Voyagers on these test strips and we analyzed um, those for neurotoxins and also microcystins and they were accurate. Um, we compared them against ELISAs. So they were ac accurate um, about 65% of the time on average. It really depended on the toxin. But the problem with those is you have to buy a kit for each individual toxin. So if you know you only have microcystin, then you're safe with buying a microcystin kit. If you don't, you'll have to buy um, multiple kits. There are only kits available for a few of the toxins. I think saxitoxin doesn't have a kit yet, if I remember right, but cylindrospermopsin does, phanatoxin, and microcystin. And they're, they act like a little, you know, it's like a pregnancy test, and it's really based on the same technology as a pregnancy test. So you dip it in the sample, and you get two lines um, I can't remember if it's two lines, if it's present or absent, I'm not sure, can't remember. But um, they're not exactly as simple as that. There's a lot of shaking and um, measuring and stuff in, the, in these little vials that you have to do. So they're a little more complicated, um, but they are available. Okay. Oh, I, I should maybe add too, there is, we did publish a report on that. Jamie LaDuke is the author of that. I can put, I can look for that um, and put it in the chat if I can find it quickly. That would be great, thank you. Um, another question for Victoria from Keith, regarding environmental model, could enhanced predictability using specific conductance be related to measurements of cations critical to toxin production? That is an interesting, um, Idea. It could be. Um, I don't know of very many uh, laboratory um, experiments that look at that. I know there's at least a few that show uh, uh, salinity um, is related to toxin production. Um, but it looks like somebody else said they want to answer the question live or can. I think that's just to um, oh. kind of move it from the queue. Yeah, I'm okay. just noting that, that you're answering the question. Okay, sorry. Um, yeah, but I really don't know the answer. There are, like I said, there are a few um, 
there are a few experiments, laboratory experiments in the literature where they do relate specific conductance to um, toxin production, but I don't know the mechanism. Like, I don't know it, whether or not that is something that encourages somehow um, toxin uh, development as a defense mechanism, or if it is something that's required um, within, you know, in order to perform the toxin production, I'm not sure. Interesting. Um, okay, Matt is new to this work and he is wondering if total nitrogen or total phosphorus is a better predictor of cyanotoxins. Okay, I, I'll try to answer that. Um, in our models, uh, total nitrogen was not a factor. Um, only total phosphorus was. And it's possible that, because that's probably the limiting nutrient in our system anyway, and I don't know about other systems, but it is possible that from the source from the water. Okay, your your audio was cutting out a little bit, um, but I can add that I think some of the literature, most recent literature that I've come across, um, the best predictor is the nitrogen to phosphorus ratio. And that's about all I can tell you on it. So, <laughs> um, all right. Uh, Jerome would like to know, did you come across the Theothrics in the mix of testing? T-H-E-O-T-H-R-I-X. Uh, no. Okay. And Sydney, Cindy has one more question. Her experience was that test strips have a pretty high detection limit. Have you found um, that? Yeah, there are two different kinds. Like there, there's one you can get for drinking water and one you can get for recreational water. And yes, I can't remember what the limits are exactly. They're much higher on the recreational water ones. Um, and they don't give an exact number either. They just say it's between the range of 10 and 20 micrograms per liter or something like that based on the, the um, how, how this line looks, how dark the line is on the strip. So yes, they're higher definitely than um, than like an LCMS test. Okay, and one more question in the Q&A. Uh, I believe it's for Victoria. What was the source of the phosphorus in the lakes? Okay, so that's an interesting question because we are not near any kind of um, urban area or agricultural area, but I did mention um, the ge geology, the, the retreating glacier left behind those sediments that are higher in phosphorus concentrations. Um, and also we did show in an earlier study that much of this phosphorus comes from the bottom sediment. So it's from internal loading. Okay, great. Um, well, we've got a couple of minutes left. I know there's a lot of uh, responses to questions in the chat as well. Um, and all of this, again, will be available on the Algal Bloom Action Team website uh, following this session. Um, I wanted to put in one more time the survey that we would appreciate your feedback on. Um, and I think, again, thank you both for Victoria and Virginia for your participation. And again, uh, everybody's welcome to reach out to the speakers directly if they would like a follow-up discussion. Um, so our next webinar is scheduled for July 7th, and if you would like to volunteer to present at that one, we will take that. Um, you can contact me directly, um, or uh, if you have suggestions for topics or speakers you would like to hear present, also include those in the survey. That would be great. Um, again, thank you all for attending, and we'll see you in a couple of months. Thank you. <laughs>